Capitalismo. En esta ocasión tenemos de invitado al filósofo y economista danés Olevier. Tendremos la sesión en inglés, pero si alguien tiene preguntas, tanto en el live stream de Facebook como en los comentarios, eh, las pueden escribir en español y yo se las traduciré. Si gustan en inglés, pues también adelante. Eh, voy a cambiar ahora a inglés. Uh, hi, welcome to another session of the Philosophy of Economics seminar. We have the honor to have here as a guest uh, Ole Bjerg. Am I pronouncing the name right, uh, Mr. Bjerg? It's good enough. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, I would like to share just something. Um, Ole Bjerg is a, a Danish philosopher and economist who teaches in the Copenhagen Business School. Uh, he has uh, he has a different array of topics that go from capitalism, money, uh, subjectivity in capitalism, and most recently uh, the topic of manhood. He has published uh, several works. These are uh, a few of them: um, the parody of capitalism, parallax of growth, the philosophy of ecology and economy, and the meaning of being a man. And of course, the book that, we'll, that we will be mainly discussing today, Making Money, Making Money or in Spanish, Hacer Dinero, which is an, uh, an amazing book, I have to say. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, Ole, thank you very much for being with us today. It's an honor. Uh, please uh, begin with your presentation. We will have uh, the Q&A session at the end of it. Um, well, go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah. So I wish I could say something in uh, Spanish, like introduction, because uh, I, I think I only know dos servicios, por favor, and vaya con días. So I'll just open with that. You can, um, you can finish with the last one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I just want to say thank you for the invitation. I'm so pleased to be here. Um, yeah, th yeah, that's, I'm really excited about that. Uh, yeah, okay. And um, I also want, also want to say thank you to Jesus, uh, who has been extremely competent and generous in uh, making this book available in Spanish. I'm, I'm very, very grateful for that. And then thank you to all your, the participants um, for yeah, having an interest in my work. And then finally, I also want to say, now I see Fabio actually clicked in. He's a very new friend of mine. But I also want to extend a thank you to him because he wrote a, this paper, which is called A Self-Fulfilling Prophecy and then something else, something else with Corona that I read. And it was extremely helpful to me in preparing uh, what I'm going to say now, because what I want to do is I want to talk about the book. And then I also want to, but the book is, even though it just came out in Spanish recently, it's, it's, it's a few years old. I wrote it sort of in 2013. 14, I can't remember, 13. So a lot has happened uh, since then. So I want to sort of start with the book, but then also sort of continue some trends into today and give my uh, opinion about what I believe is happening today. Um, and for that, uh, Fabio's work has been uh, very, very helpful. So I shared in the chat like a disposition of the uh, three questions that I'm going to address. And the first question is, what is post-credit money, which is this idea that I developed in the book. The second question is the question of why has the money system not yet collapsed? Even as I was writing the book, I was kind of thinking, oh, it's going to collapse now, it's going to collapse now. And um, well, we can debate whether it has or hasn't. But anyway, it's, it's, it's worth thinking about. Um, and then finally, I want to also end with the question of what can we hope for? Um, So, um, and also when I was writing the book, I found it was very easy to paint like a very gloomy picture of the future. Unfortunately, I think that's just been become even easier today. It's very, very easy to do that. Um, but at the same time, I, I will say that I feel somehow more uh, optimistic than I've ever felt. So, and I'd like to share that. Um, okay, so the first question, what is post-credit money? So there's a quote by um, an American economist or an historian called Michael Hudson. And he has this phrase or he has this saying where he says, debts that can't be repaid won't be repaid. The question is how they won't be repaid. And of course, that's like a comment on 
a, an economy based around debt. So he's a very, very profound thinker on the, on the notion or the phenomenon on debt. Um, so in the book, I, mm, I sort of go over these different theories of uh, money and also move up to how do they apply to the money system we have today. And the notion of credit money, which is very dominant today, is uh, basically this idea or mechanism by which money is created out of debt. And that is, that's what's happening in commercial banks. When commercial banks extend a loan, they create money at the same time. So they will put the loan onto their asset, the asset side of their balance sheet, and then they will just credit uh, your deposit account on their liability side. And in that process, they're creating debt and they're creating money at the same time. And that is the mechanism by which the majority of money, most of the money in our economy today is created in this fashion. Well, this mechanism in itself is not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have to be a problem. Um, we could imagine a credit money system that would actually be stable and balanced, but it would, there would need to be some preconditions that were kind of fulfilled for this to work. First of all, the creation of money or the supply of money would have to be proportional to economic growth. So they would have kind of have to move in lockstep. So if you have 2% growth in the real economy, you can have 2% growth in the, the money supply. Another, another uh, condition would be that the financial sector would only be like a small fraction of the entire economy. So it would be like sort of a supplement to the productive economy. Another feature would be that Mm, not necessarily all, but most of the money that was created would be lent into the productive economy rather than into the housing market or into the financial uh, economy. And then finally, well, there's, there's more, but like just to, to end this list, this another precondition would be that the er interest payments and earnings in the banking sector would be recirculating into the same economy as where the debtors are. So the people who are in debt, they have a chance of kind of earning that money back so that money could circulate between the banks, the financial markets, and then down into the productive economy and then into the banks again. So you have like a healthy circulation. And if this was the case, we could imagine, or we could see a system of credit money that would be balanced and stable. However, <laughs> that's not how the world works. It's, I mean, none of these things are true. Um, and they're even like, they're getting less and less true as we move on. So um, we have a money system that is kind of based on creating, it's just creating growing amounts of debt, more and more and more debt. And it's self-perpetuating in the sense that the more debt there is, the more there's a demand for new credit creation and new money creation. And what that produces, the, the uh, like these are, the phenomenon we see in the, the economy today is that we get a, an economy that's much more unstable. The more debt we have, it, it becomes very unstable, this economy. It also becomes much more unequal. So there will be a tendency for all the money to kind of concentrate in a smaller, smaller uh, section of the economy. What also tends to happen with this kind of, and we, we're seeing that in different places, we're seeing it in the US, for instance, is also that this money system kind of moves the, the focus and the pivot point of the economy into the financial sector, which means that the productive capacity of the uh, economy uh, is kind of eroded. Um, and then another word for this is also what we know as financialization, so that this financial dynamic or the, is kind of what is driving the economy. And, 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 and when you look at, when you kind of look at into finan the financial part of the economy, you see that the same laws that apply to a normal, regular uh, productive economy, they don't apply to the financial economy. For instance, like you would in, you will have uh, rules of supply and demand in a normal productive economy. However, in the financial, there's a tendency for debt 
and money creation tends to create its own demand. So the more debt there is, the more there's a demand for it. Uh, so it, it's kind of self-perpetuating. So there's different rules. And and so what happens is that we get an economy that is kind of runs by this uh, financial logic. So today, I think few, if any economists, anyone who knows just a little bit about economy um, think that all these all this debt, this ever-growing debt is ever going to be paid back. I think I think everyone knows it's never going to be paid back. Like the US uh, foreign debt, everyone knows it's never going to be paid back. How, how, how would that ever happen? Um, so we have this system where of perpetual debt, like today when, when, when people take out a mortgage in order to buy a house, it's like on the basis of thinking that, well, we just need to pay the interest rates and then we'll just roll over the debt. So we have these, and the same, it's the same with government debt. It's just rolled over, rolled over. So, so that plays into, hmm. so that is what I mean by this post credit money. So it's credit money, but it's post credit in the sense that it's based on debt, but it's based on a debt that everyone knows is never gonna be repaid. Um, and I also, so right now I find that there's this weird double, when you, when you hear people talk about the economy, on the one hand you hear people saying, oh, now the economy is going really well. And then at the same, and sometimes it's the same people, they say, and pretty soon it's gonna crash. So there's this, this sort of ambivalent, we don't, yeah, mm, we're not sure where it's going or, or maybe it's doing both at the same time. So there's this curious, yeah, um, weird, yeah, uh, the economy is weird at the moment. So the question here, going back to Michael Hudson is, so this this, this debt that's created in, by these uh, post-created money, how is this debt not going to be repaid? Um, and this leads into my second question, which is this question of why has, the, why has this system not yet crashed? How is it possible to have this system that just creates more and more debt and yet the debt is not, never repaid? So the question is, why, why has the system not yet crashed? The, the short answer to this question would be, it already has crashed. So for, me, if, for many people and for many countries even, it's the money system has already crashed. It's money isn't, today money isn't doing what it could do. And that leads some people to think that money in itself is bad or is evil or something like that. I don't think that's the case. I don't think money is, Money is not. I th I actually think money is good. <laughs> I think it's a money is it's it's a human creation. It's one of the most human creations that we have. And 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 I also basically think human beings are good. But then you have idiots, of course. <laughs> you have stupid people, or crazy people, and stuff. And and um. But basically, I think money is also a good thing, and it, and it can do good things. However, that's not happening at the moment because we the way we've kind of organized the money system is not uh, very good. Um, I think there's a there's a there's a huge potential in money that is not being redeemed, hmm. and that goes on the sort of societal level, society and economy, but it's also on a personal and existential level. Um, and of course, I mean the usual topics here are poverty and inequality; those are obvious. But I think it extends even further than that. To I mean. It, it seems to me that even rich people, even the ones who have a lot of money, they're miserable. <laughs> if you look at them, they're miserable. Like I was just looking, I don't know, I mean, this is anecdotal, but still like I, I read that, Bill, I, I read a, like a list of the, the most, uh, 20 most wealthy people. Uh, and and uh, a, a fair number of them had been just been divorced. Like, so Bill Gates was just divorced. Jeff Bezos, he was just divorced. And I mean, this is anecdotal, but still, I just have this feeling money is not working for anyone. It's not working for the, it's certainly not working for the poor, but it's also not working for the rich. I think also the rich are, it makes them fearful. They're so afraid. I think that's why we have, I'm going to get to that, but I think it's one of the reasons why we kind of have these sort of totalitarian tendencies in our societies. It's because the rich people, they're scared. <laughs> they're scared. They're like, shit, man, we have all this money. Maybe all some, some at some time point, all these people are going to be angry with us. So 
yeah, let's do something. Anyway, so, okay, so, so that was kind of one answer is, is that it already has crashed. Having said that, mm, the money system, it's, it's still there and it's, and it's to a large extent, it also is still functioning in a way. Um, uh, and, and, and I think first and foremost, the money system, if the money system were to crash properly, then something else could move into its place. And that's certainly not happening. Well, it hasn't happened. It may be happening, but it certainly hasn't happened yet. So I wanna talk about three trends or things that I believe kind of uh, keeps the system uh, going. Um, I get this image of, there's this uh, cartoon Oh, what's it called? There's this cartoon figure called Wiley Coyote. It's this guy, it's, it's this uh, prairie wolf or something. And he hunts this, uh, this- uh, Runner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He hunts this runner and then he gets in trouble all the time. And then one, like a classic scene is he will run and then uh, they, they, they come to like a canyon and, and then the runner does something, flies or whatever. And then Wiley Coyote, he just sort of continues into thin air and then he keeps running in thin air only to the point where he then realizes, oh shit, I've, I'm over the canyon. And then he falls. And I'm kind of, that's kind of where the economy is now. I mean, we should have fall, fallen, but for some reason we haven't. There's like some mechanism that, that hasn't kind of, um, okay. So what is it that kind of keeps the money system going despite um, all this debt and all this? So the one, the thing I talk about in the book, one of the things I talk about in the book has to do with derivatives. So you can see that the financial markets and financial institutions, they themselves are creating a mechanism that can kind of sustain this ever-growing debt. And, um, and this is derivatives. And what derivatives do is that they, they kind of allow the market, the financial markets to keep absorbing surplus debt, surplus money and surplus risk because they're kind of like, they're just these meta products that are kind of, they are more or less they're not entirely, but they, they tend to be kind of disconnected from the real economy. So they can just keep expanding. That market can just keep expanding and expanding and expanding. Um, and that kind of absorbs a lot of this uh, surplus debt. And what it also does is that it, to some extent, I wouldn't say it insulates, but it, it also tends to disconnect the financial markets from the productive economy. Um, so there's something in that, I, I described that also in the book that, that these derivatives, they, yeah, they kind of allow this, the financial markets to just keep expanding more or less independently from the productive economy. So that's the one trend. Another trend, and this is something that I don't write so much about in the book, uh, perhaps also because it wasn't, it, it wasn't as prominent when I was writing the book, but it has to do with central banks. So what happened after the financial crisis is that central banks to a large extent, they kind of, they went into the financial economy and, and kind of prevented everything from, we had a crisis, but we didn't have a real crash. So they, they did all these things to kind of save, I was gonna say save the economy, but pr perhaps primarily save the financial part of the economy. And the way they did that was first they lowered interest rates and then they started these purchasing programs and they have different names. Sometimes they're called quantitative easing. In the US, they were also called TARP, Troubled Asset Relief Program. In the Eurozone, they're called Asset Purchase Program. And there's, certain, there's probably three other names for them. But essentially what they're doing is that the central bank buys up uh, financial securities and the way they pay for them is with central bank reserve money, which is then pumped into the banking sector and then from there, it can then get sort of circulated uh, into the wider uh, financial uh, markets. Um, and the way it worked, first it was introduced as an exceptional me measure. It's like, oh, now we have this crisis. Now we, we have to do something unconventional. But like we've seen, I, I, I was gonna say, even almost since 2001, if you look at politics and law and, 
there's been this sort of governing by a state of exception. And we see then it in, in, in a lot of different areas of uh, society, we see it with terrorism, like, oh, now we have terrorism. Now we have to suspend your civil rights. We have to make this surveillance, but it's only temporary until we get these bad guys. And then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, now it's not so temporary. And now it's, well, now we're getting used to it. And that's kind of happening. And, and this is happening in monetary policy. Right now, we're also seeing it happening, I mean, big time with, oh, you can't go out, uh, outside, you need these stupid passports, all these crazy rules that are like temporary measures because now we have a, 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 this emergency and yeah. But then they tend to become the rule. Um, so that's what we're seeing in, uh, in monetary policy that now, what has happened is that these asset purchase program, they've just become the rule. And to the extent that not only do they, they just have to continue doing them because now the markets have, the economy has kind of adjusted to it. So if they were to stop doing it, the markets would crash. And what they're doing first and foremost is that they're, they're keeping the asset prices high. That's, that's fundamentally what these programs are doing. So, which means that if you own financial securities, stocks and stuff, then yeah, you, you make a lot of money. Another kind of side effect of this, these asset purchasing programs. So when they started doing it, they started buying government bonds, but then they moved into other asset classes. So now they're just buying all kinds of stuff. And some of the central banks like Japan, Switzerland, to some extent, I don't know if the ECB is buying stocks or if they're just buying uh, corporate bonds. But anyway, some of the central banks are actually buying up stocks. What does that mean? That's nationalization of the means of production. So that's communism through central bank monetary policy. That's what's happening right now. Communism through central bank. So the, uh, the central bank of Switzerland is a communist institution in that sense. It's, yeah. So the, they're nationalizing the, the, the means of production. So, so that's kind of what's, that's part of what's kind of keeping this thing going is that the central banks have kind of entered into that with their money creation power and put that in the service of, uh, of the financial markets. I could go more into that. I'm, I'm gonna go to the next uh, thing, but I will add a couple of questions that have kind of emerged with me, especially now during, I think we need to start asking a couple of questions, which is who actually runs the central banks? Who actually runs the central banks? What's the government's structure of these institutions? Who actually runs them? And also what is their mandate and priorities? What, why are they there? What, 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 yeah. So you know, in a sense, we, we we tend to think that they're democratic institutions, but I kind of doubt that sometimes when I look at what they're doing. So I think we need to start asking some of these questions, and also we need to start asking, what do we mean by central bank independence? Actually, anyway, so I'm gonna go to a third. I'm just gonna check the time here on my screen. Uh, yeah, okay, still that's have fine. plenty. Yeah, that's good. Um, so. The third trend, so the first one was derivatives. The second one was monetary policy, central banks. The third one, and this is something that has really happened now with, uh, with the virus, the, the virus situation, is that now governments have really entered into the game. So they are also putting all their weight behind sustaining this uh, system. And um, some people, for instance, my new friend, uh, Fabio, who's here, uh, and myself included, and a lot of other people would, would say, well, if it hadn't been for the, for the virus in, that, um, in, in a year and a half ago, we would have already had a financial meltdown. So if it hadn't been for the virus, we would have had a financial meltdown. So how does this work? Well, so the, the weird situation that has happened, or one of the weird things that has happened in the economy after uh, the introduction of the virus was um, on the one hand, we saw an, a real economy in recession. P 
people didn't go to work, businesses closed, all of that. And at the same time, we saw stock prices going higher than ever, which like contradicts, well, I was gonna say it contradicts all economics. It doesn't really, because if you know how economics really works, you know that that's possible, but it kind of, at least it contradicts all mainstream economics. It shouldn't be possible, but it is possible. Um, and how is, this, how is this possible? Well, one of the things that the, the virus did was that it created an excuse for the governments and the central banks to continue and even accelerate these policies of quantitative easing. So if you look at the balance sheets of the central banks, which kind of measures the amount of securities that they're buying up and also the central banks, central bank money that they put into circulation, it, it kind of like it was going up and then it went up even further. Um, so that's one thing that happened that, that just continued. And then secondly, what happened was that governments started just pumping money directly into the economy, just like literally giving people money. Like you can't go to work, you can't do this, you can't do that, but we will give you some money, here it is. Um, and that came in the form of direct payments. It also came in the form of business loans. And at the same time, a lot of businesses were also, especially small and medium-sized businesses were, uh, were closing down. They, they, they couldn't survive this uh, situation. Um, so, and I believe, or again, all of these things, all of these things are things that they only, then none of it is are permanent solutions. Quite to the contrary, they're just making it worse, but like, but they will have like a short-term effect that kind of stimulates the economy or does something. But at some point, we're going to have to pay the price for all of this, for all of it. Uh, for the derivatives, for the monetary policy, and also for the shutting down of uh, parts of the economy. You're going to pay the price for that. So um, another thing that has happened with the corona, as we've seen, is also that a lot of our civil liberties have been sort of, uh, I, don't, I don't know, suspended at least. So that makes it, it makes it quite difficult to to protest against stuff. So that means that when, and maybe that is already happening, when we start feeling the economic consequences of this whole crazy scheme of things, then we're in a situation where there's already like uh, restrictions and all that kind of stuff in place, which is gonna make it very hard for people to, to protest um, or, or risky at least. Okay, so that's kind of, um, yeah, that's, so So I believe we're kind of at the, <laughs> we're at the end of something. There's something, something is gonna give and it's gonna give soon. Uh, um, so, so, so um, yeah, so the question is, yeah, what is gonna happen? Um, and, and at this point, I'm not gonna, I could, we could, I, I could sort of could go one route, which was to just continue like thinking about, yeah, where would this end? Um, and we could end in something that we could call, uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, I, I, wanna, I wanna go to, rather than kind of paint a much a, a even gloomier picture, I'm gonna switch and say, so what should we hope for? What can we hope for? And it's coming from like, um, it's not just something I'm making up. It's really, I do hope for this. And I believe in that, that good stuff is gonna happen. I will say, however, something that we should not have hope for. So as you know, the dream of the left for many, many years has been this idea, oh, capitalism gonna crash. And then we're gonna have a communist revolution. And then everything's just gonna be super duper. I would say, this is what we're getting already. This is what's happening. I, I already mentioned it a little bit. Um, the situation we have now is that some parts of the economy, like especially small and medium sized businesses, they are right now, they're operating at the mercy of the governments. So the governments have already shown their hands and saying, we're willing to shut everything down. 
we just shut you down if you want to. So they're like, ooh, 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 ooh the government. That's what you have in communism. Communism, they have the government or some sort of kind of decides who gets to run business and who doesn't. So they can kind of plan that. So we have tendencies of that on the one hand. Then on the other hand, we also have big corporations who tend to operate beyond the market forces. They're kind of transcending the market forces, either because they're monopolies or because they have close ties to sort of government structures that gives them certain privileges or combination of both. So we have that as well. Um, like a, yeah, and then finally, or not? I can mention another. But we also another thing we have is that we have these new, or, or they're not new, but we have these institutions where the boundaries between state and corporations is completely blurred. And the ones I'm thinking about here is the World Economic Forum and the WHO, and both of these institutions have played very prominent roles in the governing of the world at the moment and this situation we're in. And yet when you look at them, you're like, what kind of an institution is this actually? I don't remember voting for Klaus Schwab ever. Who, what is this? Or even the WHO, what kind of an institution is that? So you have these things that's, it's not private, but it's not really public either. It's like this weird mixture. And I so I think, I was saying we're getting coming. We're not, maybe we're not getting, I'm, I would say what we're getting, we're getting the worst of communism and the worst of capitalism. That's what we're getting at the moment. And you could, we could, call, we could also call that some form of neo-feudalism if we wanted to. Anyway, no hope still, I know, but here's the hope. What is the hope? What we need to do, we need to move beyond Marxism, and we also need to move beyond Zizek. Like Zizek, he's like the theoretical main character of my book. And I owe a lot to Zizek. I, I don't know him personally, but I owe a lot to his thinking, but I'm also fed up with Zizek. Or there's like a, you can only come so far uh, and then you need to let go of him. Otherwise you just get really, really depressed. And what we need to move beyond is materialism in the sense of, I think that this whole movement that's going on right now. It's about more than money. Of course, it's about money, but it's about more than money. It's not just, and, and I would even go so far, I said sometimes when I look at some of the things that are going on, I think there's an element of something diabolic in it. It's not just about money, there's, there's, there's almost some evil in it. Um, so in order to understand what's going on, we can't just say, oh yeah, it's just capital. No, it's more than that. And in a way it's worse than that. The good thing is also that it kind of forces us or forces people into another realm. And what I see happening is some form of spiritual awakening that's going on at the moment. Something that also transcends these materialist ideas of both Marx and Shishik. There's something else going on. And that's really uh, my hope. And what I believe is that I think we're moving from when the process of moving from an old paradigm and the old paradigm was one where we would all be looking for freedom but we would be looking for a particular kind of freedom that was given to us by systems so the idea was oh let's build an economy that will give us consumer choice and meaningful work oh let's build a political system that will give us some rights Let's build a legal system that will give us justice. Let's build a medical system that will give us health. Let's build an educational system that will give us knowledge and so forth. The problem with these things or the limitations of this is that as long as these are freedoms that are given to you by the systems, they can also be taken away by the systems. And that's what we're seeing right now. That's what we're feeling with our bodies all of the things that we took for granted are getting dead taken away from us like that with a snap. The good thing about this is that it forces us into a new paradigm where what we shouldn't be looking for is not freedom, it's sovereignty. Not freedom, but sovereignty. And I think that's what people are waking up to right now. Um, and the difference between freedom and sovereignty is that sovereignty 
is not something that's given to you by a system. It's there all the time. It's something you are, it's with, with Heidegger, we could say freedom is ontic, sovereignty is ontological. It's part of your being. You just need to wake up to it. You need to realize it. Um, you just need to look inside and, and find it and, and wake up. And then, it's, and then it's there right in front of you. So what does this mean in practical terms? Well, in the realm of money, I think what we're realizing is that we don't need, we don't need all these, we don't need governments or banks or central banks for that matter in order to create money. We can create our own money. So that's what's happening in the world of cryptocurrencies. It's a really good thing. People are taking their monetary sovereignty back or no, they're not taking it back. They're just discovering it. Oh, we can just make our own money. We'll do that. The same thing is happening in, within health. People, a lot of people are waking up to the fact that we don't need the medical industry to be healthy. We can do all kinds of stuff with our own bodies. We can do meditation, we can do breath work, we can do plant medicine, we can do all kinds of stuff. We don't need these corporations to give us our health. We can just create it ourselves. And another thing, and um, you say, there's this saying, you shouldn't shit where you eat. <laughs> so, but that's what I'm gonna do now. Another thing that people are waking up to is that we don't need universities to educate ourselves. Young people, I know this, they just go on YouTube rather than listen to old farts like myself. Uh, they just, it's right there. And it's even better, a lot of the things they get. So they're just checking out of the, um, checking out of the universities and, and looking for finding knowledge elsewhere. And we, I could do the same thing with all the systems. So in all the systems, people are just checking out of them uh, and rediscovering or discovering their sovereignty uh, and figuring out that that's a lot better. Um, in a way, I was thinking maybe this is kind of a second reformation. So the first reformation was people discovering, oh, we don't need the church or the priests in order to find God. We can just check in with him ourselves. So we don't need that. And it's like the same movement is now happening with all the other systems. Like we don't need the health system to, yeah. So, um, and in this process, the knowledge we need in this process or the ideas and all the things and principles, some of it is new, but a lot of it is just old. It's just rediscovering old stuff, old knowledge that we kind of, oh no, this is stupid. We don't need this anymore. And then we're rediscovering that now. And I will too, and this is going to be my final point. Um, so this wake, waking up is happening outside the systems and inside the system. So outside the systems, you will have people who are just lay persons who say, oh, I don't need the medical system. I don't need, I, I can just be healthy myself. So I, didn't, I don't need that system. But it's also happening inside the systems. So there's doctors waking up, there's academics waking up, there's lawyers waking up, there's judges waking up, there's even some politicians who are waking up, there's people who are waking up inside the systems. And, and I think ultimately that's gonna make these things crumble because they're gonna, this, all the systems, including, it's gonna be like raisins. It's like that they're, they're just gradually drying up um, and I think it even, once we start thinking about thinking in, I'm, I'm going to finish now. I'll just, as the, my final word here is, I think even some of these figures like Bill Gates, Tony Fauci, Klaus Schwab, they're even going to wake up. They will even wake up. So it's going to be great. I think this, so you, so, so, um, yeah, I see that happening. And so I'm, I'm extremely optimistic that we're just waking up to, we don't need these systems, um, and then we're going to be sovereign, and that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bjerg. Uh, I can tell you how excited I am by everything you said because I think I, 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 I reached some of those ideas myself, like just uh, wondering about them. The education one, I saw that here in Mexico, right? Uh, the government kept insisting on online classes and 
poor kids they were so sad right like forced on the screen doing uh yeah doing things they don't want uh, at home and and at the same time i was learning for example I mean, i'm not a kid but i was learning to use new software through youtube right and doing a lot of things that this is how education is wow. supposed to work what do i want to learn where can i get it right you don't need like a a, a centralized system for that the, the issue, education should be evenly distributed in every aspect of our lives i think and, and regarding your spiritual awakening uh uh, there's this book I always talk about. People here may be sick of it. Uh, this Life by Martin Haglund, which uh, I will rec- I will write it. Uh, I think yeah, I think yes, maybe yes, you should please. read it because it has this yeah. idea of a spiritual awakening of uh, what we should ba- what our societies should shift towards uh, is the value of free time, or the value of owning our time and do what we want to do with it. Where, but that means commitment, not like hedonistic. Uh, not like hedonistic, do whatever you like, regardless of what happens, but commitment of what the material conditions of existence are necessary and, mm-hmm. and how we should um, existentially change our, our system of value to, to, to value and confront what we want to do. And in that challenge, find ourselves. Because even if I want to, I don't know, be a, an engineer, maybe I will fail at it, but now it will be because I know that I wasn't fit for it and not because I didn't have the time because I had to work a worthless job that doesn't do anything. So, mm. and I've seen other proposals, Kate Sopper, uh, 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 an English philosopher, she has a proposal called alternative hedonism, which she's basically says the same thing that we should mm. shift or, um, uh, or, or idea of pleasure and a good life to a slower moving one, uh, com- communality, uh, mm. stuff like that. So, so, but I notice this, this ideas keep growing and growing and growing. And with the face of climate disaster uh, upon us, uh, it, it's, uh, I think it's becoming even more relevant that the community is what builds us, right? Uh, what you say about money, it's something, uh, oh, do you want to say something, excuse me? I, I, I agree with everything you said with one exception. It's and and as you you were so kind to show in the beginning my my books and one of them is this book Parallax of Growth and in that I actually I, I kind of go into this debate about climate change and all that and I have no I I don't know anything about the climate science and I have no opinion on it but what I do have an opinion about is the fear that's running through that whole idea this whole idea that we're on the brink of total destruction or total catastrophe and what that does is that it paralyzes people and i could i could see that in all these movements that people they were just so paralyzed by this fear and and fear is not it's not a good place from where to act you need to act from a place of love that's a lot better completely and and in that whole climate change yeah catastrophe doomsday thing there's too much fear. That's way too much fear. So I, I'm all for, we need to reconnect with nature. We need to reconnect with the planet. I'm all for that. But what I'm not for is this idea that, oh, in five years, the whole world is gonna collapse. Mm, Cause I don't think that's gonna happen. And, I, and, and that's, based on, that's based on theology more than it's based on climate. It's b- because what I find in this idea is of, of climate change and catastrophe is a um, this preposterous idea that human beings, we are so big that we can destroy the earth that was created by God or created by the universe or something. I don't buy that. We are not that big. <laughs> We're not that important. We should let go of that and trust the earth. The earth is much bigger than, she'll do fine. We don't have to worry about it. It's like it's like kids who worry about their parents. It's not a good thing. Kids should worry about their own life, not about their parents. And it's the same with this climate movement. It's kids worrying about their parents. It's not a good thing. So, and I know that's I'm not that's not what you're saying, but I, I just wanted to make that point because we need in this move. The old paradigm is based on fear. The new paradigm is based on love. So everything that has to do with fear, let go of it, and then move into love.
I completely agree. And even in your book, you stated Sorry. that way, right? Like, like uh, it's a system that runs on risk, trying to solve risk and then creating it, right? It's it's the same idea that when you fear something, you will bring it about something like that, right? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and we and we work towards that. Well, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, if someone wants, uh, we will open Mr. the questions in a moment. I would just like to, to ask uh, uh, one of my, I have a few questions, but I would like to ask yeah. one moving to the topic of cryptocurrency. I become uh, knowledge, I become knowledgeable of cryptocurrency uh, recently because of NFTs and other stuff. And I see huge power in that. I, I'm really upset when I see on the media all the criticisms towards it. Um, and there are extremely valid criticisms, right? But they do a lot of things wrong. They confuse Bitcoin with all cryptocurrency. They, um, the, the, the bad characteristic of Bitcoins, they extrapolate that to everything and they insist that it's too volatile. But what about the volatile? mess of this system that we're living like i don't see how the that volatility is somehow worse than the current depreciation that we're living my, my question goes like this we've recently seen how cryptocurrency gains even more traction and adoption and news and everything many countries are developing their own digital currency that, that's something funny uh, you can see in the newspaper oh cryptocurrency is volatile and awful and then right after china is developing its own cryptocurrency so i mean yeah. that we should change our imaginary on that but but the, yeah. in, in your book you describe how financial capital works with the state basically the financial capital makes money they make money making money like you said uh, and then when crisis occurs the state backs them up uh, a, a form of keynesianism a, a sick form of keynesianism i would say while yeah. burdening citizens with monetarism that's that's the awful thing about our political discourse it's always more taxes or less taxes that's the most awful questions that, that there is it, it, it's it's so old it's so passed behind that that idea i think i see this as a state being negligent in the best case and an accomplice in the worst case do you see any potential in cryptocurrency to offer a new monetary imaginary and with a new monetary imaginary, a new political one, uh, like you said, of creating our, our own money that we can determine how it's uh, how it's minted? Uh, I don't know, all of that. What, what do you think about that, that idea? Well, I think you, you've answered some of the question yourself. So I'm, I am, and I see the same things in the way that, uh, so I have these journalists, they kind of, whenever Bitcoin is going up, they call me and say, oh, what about, and, and they post these questions. Um, one of the things I really like about cryptocurrencies, and it kind of comes back to, so I wrote this book about poker. And one of the things I liked, so I compared poker to financial capitalism, but I would say one of the, um, one of the advantages, one of the better, th one, one of the reasons why I, I like poker a lot better than capitalism, first of all, is a lot more honest. <laughs> yeah. maybe people may be bluffing but you know they're bluffing and and also you can decide whether you want to sit down in a poker game or not you can just if you don't like poker you can just not be in it but that's not the way our monetary system works it's not like oh i don't want to be in that however now that opportunity is opening up so if people want to use bitcoin they can do it if they don't they cannot do it. I think they can use the dollar instead or something else. And I think, so th there's also. Excuse me, I was trying to mute someone else, uh, Mr. Bjerg. Uh, can you unmute yourself, Mr. Bjerg? I think I'm back now. Yes, you are. Sorry yeah. about that. It moved then. No, that's okay. I think my, my, just now that we're in the technical area, I just want to turn on the light here in my, because it's, it's getting dark here in my living room. So just two seconds. Please go ahead. Yes. Uh, para todos, eh, de nuevo, en un momento, vamos a brillar la, o sea, esa fue mi primera pregunta. La pregunta, las preguntas que todos tengan, si la tienen en español, la pueden decir y yo con gusto la voy a traducir. Gracias. Yeah. So now we're ready. Um, no, so, 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 oh yeah, one, one thing I also, I've noticed that what happens in a lot of the mainstream critique of cryptocurrencies 
it's not the same thing that happened in uh, relationships <laughs> that you kind of project your own faults or your own errors or yeah shortcomings you project that onto your partner and it's the same here so all the things that are wrong with the dollar they project that onto bitcoin oh it's volatile okay so since when was the dollar not volatile it's been inflationary since money laundering I mean, for, yeah the second thing is crime Ooh, it can be used for crime okay so the dollar can't be used for crime what are you talking about and then there's this idea one of the things that kind of circulating is this about the energy consumption and yes i'm sure there's energy consumption in bitcoin mining however i think it's hugely overstated i think it's someone once made this back of an envelope calculation of how much energy bitcoin is using and then that just travels around i i haven't looked into it i don't have that competence but and and also i mean if we look at the regular system how much energy is that using a lot more i'm sure so so there's all these things that are kind of projected onto to cryptocurrencies that yeah is uh, more a description of the existing system so, yes and, and i mean the, the money the the energy consumption i think in bitcoin it, it is i mean it is very real because of how it works but is it really doesn't happen with most other cryptocurrencies so so yes i mean they just uh yeah. talk about one specific instance yeah. and not about uh, everything else and also the potential right the potential for communities to form their own money uh, and how it's uh, transacted and for what i think that's extremely powerful and an idea that since the media doesn't really understand money, I mean, most of them, uh, they really don't want to imagine any any version different yeah. of it. For example, what, let's, what, oh, yes. let's look at let's let's open up for uh, let's open up for some questions from uh, yes yeah from from the audience. I don't know how you want to run it whether people announce this in the chat or whether they just unmute or how that works. If someone wants to raise their hand and uh, and ask a question or write it on the chat, please go ahead. Uh, Fabio wants one. Go ahead, Fabio. Thank you. And you, you need to unmute yourself, Fabio. Uh, yes. Sorry, I should know that. I, I teach with this, so I, I really should know this. But <laughs> uh, first of all, really nice to meet you. Um, I just wanted to say a little little story that we just met basically a couple of days ago by exchanging emails. So going back to what you said about the sort of liberating potential that we are experiencing now at the at the height of uh, a real real problem, right? A, a kind of almost authoritarian um, uh, um, global world in which we are being plunged all of a sudden by this virus. There there are also possibilities of liberation from this, right? And I totally agree with you, and I really welcome your optimism um, on on that. However, I think we are uh, still uh, digging. Right, I think we still need to um, overcome certain issues. As you know, my view uh, of uh, financialization is one whereby the financial system really is a kind of escape route for traditional capitalism. So for the kind of capital labor dialectic. The reason why we've financialized so heavily in, in the recent decades is precisely because the labor capital dialectic has um, imploded in many ways, right? And for me, it's almost like evolutionary Darwinism. So we are at a point where the, the, the labor society doesn't work, the work society doesn't function anymore. And that's for imminent reasons, as far as I'm concerned, because of automation, rampant automation and the elimination of, of work. And therefore, uh, capitals uh, uh, drive towards the financial system where, they, where which everything is much more profitable basically than the labor economy, right? So I think, and, and that leads me to the question, um, can we really be so optimistic when the whole structure needs to be reformed, right? Or, or restructured really, because it's not just a matter of taking one, one piece of it, but you know, the whole social structure needs to be rethought. Um, and, and, and that requires probably a lot of effort. And, and also, I would say that we are still within a capitalist system, but a capitalist system that is turning totalitarian. It's, tu it's turning slowly but surely totalitarian. And that's its only way of surviving its own death, as it were. So um, for me, communism, yes, but you can call it uh, capitalist communism or whatever, like, you know, like in China, maybe something like that. 
but it's fundamentally still a, st a capitalist structure based on profit making. Um, you know, even, even the financial system um, with virtual money, the dominant ideology, the dominant kind of at an ontological level, you know, um, it's, it's profit making. Um, so that needs to be, to be overcome somehow. Mm. And, you know, I agree with you that there are openings, that there's potential for change, but I think there's a lot of work to do first and foremost in overcoming the fear that we have because yes. we're all paralyzed by fear, right? Yes. We're all totally, we're sleepwalking into this and, yes. and we, we are far from awakening. And, and I think the system, and, I, and when I talk about the system, I talk about the, the kind of financial gurus coupled with the politicians. The politicians are, I think, obeying orders fundamentally, right? They're just doing what they're told yeah. to do. They're, they're almost like given a script to read and they go along with it. You know, they will do whatever they can to retain their privileges and to retain their capital as well, right? The, the power that they have. So yeah, the first step yeah. is, that, is that sort of giving, that, that liberating ourselves from this fear that we have that, you know, we, we, we don't think we can even say anything yeah. that mildly controversial, um, you know, and that's, that's a big thing. Sorry, it's, it's a bit no, of a No, 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 that, that's, that's uh, I, um... I th you 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 kind of you first you said the system needs to be reformed, and then you said the systems need to be rethought. I don't think the systems need to be reformed. I think they need to die. Yeah. And then we need to and and then we'll just create something new. So Sorry, rather you, than you, yeah yeah you I, reform I, I, what is this bad choice yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Of, of yeah. So, so, I mean, but so because radically you, rethought yeah yeah. So I think I think the systems. I think the system, they, the system will die uh, just be, simply by people leaving, checking out of them, and then they kind of like uh, collapse. And then I trust that something else is going to um, uh, emerge in their yeah. place. And then the question here is, how is this going to, how is this, because if you look at it one way, it's, it looks very gloomy, but um, I think I have this, and again, this is a little, anyway, we're philosophers, so we can speculate. But I, I know at one point I noticed that the, the, the virus, it has two names. The one is COVID-19, the other is Corona. COVID is, I see the signs when, I, when you drive on the highway, there's these signs like COVID uh, vaccination center, test center, COVID, COVID. Like, and you're like, whoa, whoa, you don't want that. But then Corona is a completely, it's the same, but then it's, I mean, and you're most of, you know, Spanish, so you know, you know, Corona, what I mean, it means crown. And then I looked up in a dictionary, what does crown actually mean? And the dictionary said, crown is a symbol of sovereignty. So what I think, is going on is that there are two viruses and they spread in kind of the same way by sort of human interaction. So you, you interact with the person and then you can catch this, the one virus, but the other one, and I've experienced that myself, the, the, the sovereignty virus also spreads. So if you are sovereign and I know, I, I mean, I'm not, I haven't worn the mask. I, I've worn the mask like five times or something. I, I just didn't, I could just feel, no, that's not for me. And then I figured out, I can just check out of it. You don't have to wear it. It's just like something they, it, it, they pretend you have to wear it, but you, you at least in my country, you don't. So, mm, so I don't wear it. And I can see that it's contagious, not in the sense that people get sick from me, but they're like, whoops, he's a sovereign guy. And they sense the energy. And I, I'll share another little uh, story story i was i was traveling to uh, finland this summer and oops what happened there no, we left oh, okay he can come back so ah he moved there anyway so um i was traveling to finland and i'm also not the uh, all this test thing is also not for me so i i, I didn't want to get tested because <laughs> yeah i'm not sick so why would i want to be tested of course, you, you need to, if you're sick, you need a test. But if you're not, you don't need a test. Anyway, so, but I had to travel. So I went to the airport and I was like, will they let me on the plane? And then I was at the counter 
and in front of me was a, the system in a way, but it was a human being. There was a human being in front of me and it came down to that human being making a decision of whether I got on the plane or not. And I got on the plane, also the other way. And I think that's what's also happening here is that people inside the system are waking up as human beings. They're kind of, and when that happens, that whole power that is based on systems is just going to crumble. And that can happen very fast. So I think when the, when the real corona, the sovereignty virus, when that starts spreading, and I see that happen, I see that happening, and I, I've yet to see someone who has waken up who has fallen asleep again. That's not happening. It's only going one way, and it's going to be exponential. So I'm. Uh, I, and so I think that's the. That's that's how the syst the change is going to happen. Is people getting the real the good coronavirus, the sovereignty virus, because they see other people, and they see, I mean. That I know who are sovereign, who are like, oh, they're happy, <laughs> they're optimistic like me, they're happy. So you kind of look around, do you want to be one of the, oh no, I get the virus, or do you want to be one of these guys like, oh yeah, I'm happy, everything's going to be fine. What what team do you want to be on? So I think that a lot, I mean, yes, we also do need to do some practical things, but a, a lot of it is just also about just energy. Like if you spread that energy, uh, people wake up. I, I truly believe that because I've experienced it myself and I see it happening all around me. Thank you very much for the answer and the question, Fabio. Uh, by the way, Fabio, is there any way you can uh, share with us in the chat the paper that Ole mentioned he read from you? That, that will be great. Uh, you have something else to say? I, I, I just want to quickly, very quickly, um, just to say that I've experienced, unfortunately, the opposite. I was trying to be sovereign <laughs> in, in an airport and I was almost beaten up um, for not for not wearing the mask, right? Um, yeah. And 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 I when when you feel that degree of discrimination, exclusion, yeah. and you know violence, really, um, then you fear for the worse. Um, yeah. And 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 yeah, it's it's not nice. And you, you think yes, it'd be nice if it happened um, so easily that people suddenly awaken and realize that there's a different way of going about this. But I think that uh, in ideological terms, um, those who are in power will do whatever they can to keep instilling fear, to keep controlling <coughs> populations, including through, you know, central bank digital currency. This, you know, the, the, as we know, the central banks have been talking about it for a while. I can see how the passports, the digital passport, will lead eventually to that, and and that will create even more. But uh, you know, I. I don't want to elaborate on that. I, I love your optimism and I, I share it. And um, and yeah, so sorry about that. But about the paper, uh, I can share the link. That will Maybe. be great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jesus has uh, a question. Go ahead, Jesus. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I am surprised because I think that usually philosophers tend to be not that optimistic. I think it goes against the, our our discipline, right? So it's interesting to see the uh, somebody who goes against this more powerful tradition in, in our uh, discipline. Uh, my question is: in the in the at the end of making money, I think uh, you are for a more tradi or Maybe you are expecting for a more traditional movement that will change things and that can change the way we're making our money. And I, I know also that you are part of an organization in Denmark that was trying to organize uh, to, yeah, to advance a, a very ambitious reform on the monetary system. And a few years later, is like uh, society. I don't know if we lost our interest in the monetary uh, system in the central banks. But for example, now in the midst of this huge crisis, it seems that there are no political uh, organized groups fighting in this like more traditional way. Maybe in the individual, at the individual level, we find some uh, 
change of attitude. I, I don't know, some lights that start to, to, to show here and there, and we can expect that something good is going to happen. But at the same time, uh, I don't know, it's like we didn't uh, overcome the trauma of the crisis, the big financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. And nowadays, even in the midst of this huge crisis, uh, like, for example, we don't have, I think we are weaker now than we were a few years earlier uh, in terms of, yes, questioning how the banks are working or fighting for, a, for a, a something ambitious in terms of reforming the banking system. Uh, so I, I think I'm trying to go back to the, proverbial pessimism <laughs> i'm not taking your bait jesus <laughs> so i will say this it is true that that like parallel to my sort of academic work on um, on money i've also been engaged in so the danish branch of the what it called the international monetary in the international movement for monetary reform so the, in the uk is the positive money and um, but I actually, um, I left that movement. And uh, the reason is that um, while I still think that there, 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 was, there, there was a way or there is a way that you could implement central bank digital currencies in a good way that, that could happen or it could have happened i think we're past that point but it could have happened but i i experienced that all of a sudden central banks became very interested in the idea of central bank digital currency however they seem to be interested in it for the wrong reasons and also i i i suspect or i sense that they may be implementing it in the wrong ways i think fabio touched upon this a little bit so rather than, for me, central bank digital currencies would have been a way of taking the money creation and put it in, in, putting it back into a democratic institution and using it to gain sort of sovereignty, have, have like a sovereignty of the nation. So the nation creates its own currency and has sovereignty. That was my idea. My, but that's not what's going to happen. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think we're going to see something. So I couldn't kind of stand behind that idea. So I checked out of that movement. So right now, I don't think the solution is central bank digital currencies. I don't think, um, I don't see that happening. Um, and I, I think, I think we're going to see, I think cryptocurrencies is part of a solution. And then I think we need some other changes. There needs to be some changes or something we need to sort of rediscover our political sovereignty, our legal sovereignty and so forth before it makes sense to, I think, make a new like national, if, we, if we're even gonna get that a new national monetary system. So I think it's a, I, I, it's a good question, uh, Jesus. Um, I just, <sighs> I, I just think that the battle right now for me is, is on a completely different frequency or it's it's about yeah, something I, else. Yeah. I just had th this idea now, maybe you don't uh, have an answer yet, but have you thought of, just as you came up with this beautiful concept of post-credit money to describe the kind of money that organizes capitalism today, uh, I wonder if you have thought of a name for the kind of money that could uh, take us to a, a different. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's a challenge for the <laughs> yeah for a forthcoming article. It's it's actually it's something I so um, sovereign money. Yeah, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna. So what I do in the in making money in the making money book is that I use I take Shizik's concept of the subject and then I apply it to money. After I've written the book, I wrote the book, I, I kind of little, I, I have a certain dissatisfaction with Shizek. And one of them is, I think that his idea of the subject is too, 
it's too poor. It's a subject, his, the fundamental concept in Zizek's conception of subjectivity is desire. So that's kind of what defines a subject. I think that belongs to the old paradigm where you desire some sort of object that circulates in a system. So you kind of rely on, it's like a relation between the subject and the system. I think what, what I believe or the subject that we need, the way we need to think about the subject or the human is through love. So it's not desire that is kind of our defining. I think even this idea of desire kind of pushes us to the level of animals rather whereas love is something that kind of pushes us upwards it makes us bigger beings and i think that's where we need to go we need to have and and she's he i know he has ideas about love but they are crazy or they are not very good so we need to build a new understanding of the human being in terms of love and then the question that i haven't answered yet myself but i'm it's kind of i'm thinking i need to think about that at some point what would the equivalent form of money or the corresponding form of money, what would that be? What would that look like? And I would say as much as I love cryptocurrency, I'm not sure it's going to be Bitcoin. Uh, or I don't know. It's um, what kind of human relationship would, would it cause? But it's a good, uh, it's, yeah, I think I'm just, uh, it's a really, really good question. Jesus. Uh, and uh, yeah, I need to think more about it and we need to talk more about it. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, unless I see, well, uh, we still have time for questions, but I would like to read a question from the Facebook uh, stream uh, yeah. from Francisco DeSantis. I'm, I'm reading directly. Firstly, I would like to say that your book, Making Money, is very stimulating because it shows how Zizek's ontology has a great interpreted, 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 national, interpretational, interpretational, interpretational capacity to analyze different kinds of subjects, in this case, money. Having said that, I'd like to ask you about the last part of the book, Specifically, the claim about banking reform inspired in Hubbard's and Robertson's senior edge reform. It was a very unexpected conclusion, although I didn't have a precise clue about what, how the book was going to end. The absolute conservatism, um, quoting, of the reform is to restrict the bank's capacity of lending money and restore the state monopoly of making money. Essentially, as you suggest, it is to force the banks to act according to the ideological belief that the people already have about them to set up an equivalence relation between the credit money of the banks and the fiat money created by the government. I think that such reform wouldn't generate an experience of traversing the fantasy, but an attempt to materialize the fantasy in the real world. So in Jujikian terms, what will be the ideological effect of that reform? Wow. <laughs> what, an, what an amazing reading and question. Wow. I have the feeling it kind of connects the two previous questions um, or the, the discussion we just had, I just had with Jesus. Well, the thing is, I th as I've moved beyond the book, I kind of tend to agree that no, that's not a good solution. It's not, it's, just, it's too flat in a way. And it's too, although I, I, I don't, think conservatism is necessarily a bad thing in itself, but there is something conservative about kind of like pulling banks back to something. And I think that's what I believed at the time, but I don't think I believe it anymore. I think there is something we kind of need to uh, push forward to, towards something else. Um, and so so the question was something along the lines of, was it traversing the fan, what truly traversing the fantasy or was it something along those lines, Lucas? Yes, excuse me. I have it here, um, the, the, the last part, right? Yeah. I think that such reform, that the solution, wouldn't generate an experience of traversing the fantasy, nope. quote, but an yeah. attempt to materialize the fantasy in the real world. So in Dijekian yeah. terms, what will be the ideological effect of doing the reform? Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what would be the ideological effect? Uh, well, maybe I don't know. To some, maybe what, maybe what is actually happening now? Like, maybe it is what we're seeing now. It's is that I thought, oh, this is going to liberate us, and what's going to no, it's just going to make it even worse because uh, we're going to move all this power over to the to the central banks. Mm. 
I don't know. I'm not sure I can get a, give an answer that kind of, it's a extremely, and it, it's such a pleasure to be read like that. It's like, wow, here's a person who really reads my text. So I, I'm, I'm really grateful for the, for, the, uh, for the question. I think it's something I need to go back and kind of rethink a little bit more with this uh, Shisha thing. Maybe Fabio can help me. Uh, do you want to say something, Fabio? I just wanted to say that maybe this notion of traversing the fantasy is actually a crucial one. Obviously, in Lacanian terms, traverse the fantasy means confronting a sort of unconscious, traumatic mm -hmm. attachment to something, right? So maybe what's going on now or what will happen more and more as capitalism implodes is that we will be forced by necessity, right? Almost like in a quasi-deterministic way, Hegelian way, to confront our unconscious attachment of, to the system, right? To commodity fetishism and all the rest of it. Mm. In order to move beyond it, in order to find it traumatic or traumatizing, because the system is unable to provide what it promised to provide in the past, right? This commodity utopia won't happen again. We know that the labor utopia, full employment, it won't happen. If it happens, it happens in the form of slavery which is not what capitalism offered before or, or, or near slavery, right? Some, some form of underemployment, which of course has got nothing to do with the promise of, mm. of enjoyment that capitalism contained up until a few years, a few maybe decades ago, right? And so, now it's waning, sorry. I, I think, what... no, yeah, no, no I, I think that sounds fruitful. What if, what if traversing the fantasy means that if we do that properly and truly confront these attachments, we can break out, we can even break out of this Lacanian idea of the subject as such. We kind of, we, we break out of, yeah, that whole scheme and get into another, because I think the, the, the thing I have with Zizek and, and Lacan is that it's, it's a tragic figure. It's always like, yeah, then you traverse the fantasy and then you get rid of one desire and then there's just another one. And it's, it's always unfulfilled. It's always like the next, the next, the next, the next, the next. This is a tragic figure. Um, and I don't like that. And I was kind of thinking, I was thinking a little bit about the difference between desire and love. Whereas desire kind of, it's, it, it has its attention towards the object all the time. And it's always unfulfilled. Whereas I was thinking about love. I was thinking about, so I met, I met uh, this summer, I met my, um, the, 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 the girl that I was in love with when I was in, third grade or all, all through my like kindergarten and all that uh, i was just in love with her uh, and i was we never really i don't know what you would what even do when you're third grade i mean i didn't know what but i just i was just in love with her and then i met her again and i was just like wow it was just so nice to see it and the love was still there and i was kind of thinking wow even though we never did anything or anything maybe that was a full experience of being eight years old and just fully in love. So, and, and we have this concept of, I am in love, I am in love. So I can sort of be that. So I'm, what I'm trying to think of is whether, how that kind of, this sense of love kind of fits the idea of sovereignty because it's, it's something that's actually independent of anything external. I can be, she doesn't have to be in love with me. I can just be in love with her. And then that's fine uh, in a way. So anyway, I'm, I need to think a little bit more about this, but there's, there is something about sort of, if we were to tr go through this Shishik thing, I'd want us to get so much momentum that we can kind of go all the way out of the center of gravity of this ontology of lack. I want to move beyond that. And, and going back to your question, Jesus, I think that's also my, in, in a way, my theory of money is also a tragic theory because all the three theories are incomplete. That's kind of the point there. Yeah, commodity theory, ah, not so much. State theory, ah, not so much. Credit theory, ah, not so much. So we just get this endless circulation. So I would need to think what would a money that kind of moves out of that whole ontology of like, what, what would a full form, what would that look like? Uh, I haven't figured that out, but uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Fabio. Uh, is there any other question or hand? Um, I, I, there's no more things on Facebook. Uh, if not, or, or while someone has a question, um, 
uh, Martin Haglund Ole has something very beautiful in his books this life that says love is not the end of res responsibility but just the beginning and he tells that love implies a responsibility with a thing love uh, it's, I think it's what you're saying that if you if you love your partner your community life you have to work towards it it will never be fulfilled it will never be but that's part of it that part of being in it is part of being involved actively involved in it it's not something you're passive towards but something you're active towards but not in the gjx sense of of like anxiety or, or wanting it but of working with it and knowing that that the finitude is part of what makes it beautiful as well yes so, and, yeah. if i could add something I, i love that idea and what i also find is that if you if you approach the world with love it allows you to actually take responsibility and also to a large extent take control of your experience of the world. So I, um, I, did a, I did a podcast with one of my friends and we had this, so we, 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 we wanted to, um, we made this meditation where we would think about who, who is our, who's like the, who, who, is, who is the one that is most difficult for us to take into our hearts. And my friend, For him, it was the director of the Danish Central Bank. And for me at the time, it was Klaus Schwab. So we made this, I made this Klaus Schwab meditation where I would visualize Klaus Schwab's mother holding Klaus Schwab. Uh, so, and, and what that did to me, I, I could really sense because before that I had like this, ah, Klaus Schwab. And now I'm more, I don't, I don't fear Klaus Schwab anymore. I can love him. I can I can kind of see well Klaus Schwab, you you also play your role in this whole waking up process. So thank you Klaus Schwab for waking me up. Thank you. I love you for that. So I think if we approach the world with love, um, I've also I'm still working on Tony Fauci. I will say I'm not I'm there I'm not, I'm not there completely. I need to work with uh, Tony Fauci, but I'm there with Klaus Schwab. I can and I can recommend it to you. So um, yeah, so if we yeah, so so if we just meet meet the meet the things we love, and then we and then the fear disappears, and then we are invincible. Then they, and I get it, Fabio. Yeah, you get knocked out, and uh, I don't I don't want to. But anyway, I just think this yeah general approach of uh, love is, and then they lose then they they lose control over us. All these systems of domination they're based on fear. So if we can check out of the fear, we become. Uh, invincible i yeah i will uh yes uh, i i will check well who you mentioned uh, but uh yes uh, actually well haglund says that that fear or anxiety is always an existential part of us in that sense but yes it shouldn't let us blind us if we work with love and responsibility and actively engage in what we care about i would like to read a question from facebook from tijuana Ga grassroots uh, a grassroots organization over there but they're interested in this Changing gears a bit with, uh, with a question, how can the technologies of cryptocurrency help us organize other systems in society outside of finance? Are you familiar with the concept of cyber socialism? End of question. I'm not familiar with cyber uh, socialism, um, but I will say I was, uh, I was, I think this was last year or half a year ago. But anyway, uh, at some point within the last year, I was contacted by uh, two guys who had made a system which they called um, ION. And ION stands for I owe the network. Mm. And, uh, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's not necessarily a cryptocurrency, but it can be connected to a cryptocurrency. But it is this sort of very, very ingenious uh, network to, 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 uh, to facilitate uh, exchange And it has this sort of built in, it's kind of like um, foolproof in the sense that it can't be financialized. So you can create credit in it, but there's something, there's a mechanism within it, which means that you can only create credit to the extent that you have like a productive capacity. So it's like, so anyway, and this, I'm sure there's plenty of, but this is just one that sort of came uh, um, my way. So that would be one example of, I think, doing some of these things like facilitating real economic exchange uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way. Uh, so uh, yeah, so yeah, so, so that would, 
and I yeah, as I said, I think there's I think of course there's some cryptocurrencies are scam and they yeah yes, but then there's others that are brilliant. Um, so I think yeah, I'm I think that's an area where technology is our friend. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other question there. Does someone uh, present at the session have a, a question they would like to raise? Uh, well, that happens. I don't see any hands yet. Uh, I would like to raise a, a philosophical kind of question. Um, mm -hmm. You let me. Uh, Graham Harman is an American philosopher who has had like a beef with Zizek because he proposes object-oriented ontology. My question goes towards that and also with something Fabio mentioned. So if you want to chime in in a moment, Fabio, that will be yeah. great. Um, uh, something I'm passionate about your book is that your view towards money is not condescending. You study it in its depth. Ontol object or interontology and new, re new realism have a similar approach. They say basically that all objects are profound and their reality exceeds us. We, you can never exhaust objects because they, they, they are something different from us. They are not de determined by the subject, even though we can project ourselves in them. They are not fully determined by us. Uh, this goes in line with post-humanist philosophy, where human subjectivity no longer has dominance over objects, but acknowledges their influence over us. I think you have some of that at the end of your book when you talk about financial systems. They work even if don't, we don't believe in them. So that, that's, that will be part of it. They work even if we don't actually believe in them. Um, Graham Harman actually has a concept of overmind that describes your account of post-credit money, a money reduced to its ontic reality as a, as, as a financial flow completely bowed to its creators, doesn't do anything else than that, unable to work differently. Do you think, uh, do you think that thinking in this fashion, uh, like, like, uh, like establishing the dignity of objects of their full reality and they, what they can do for us uh, can help us think uh, better about objects like money or value the object does not mean material thing, but, but like a, mm. a, a broad conception of object uh, to work with them instead of making them work for us. And I, and I, and I mentioned Fabio because I, I am very skeptic towards the idea of the totality of we have to change the system on the totality. I agree with that, but I think an, a totality approach is incredibly difficult. While an approach toward objects, how we can change the object money for us, how we can change the object value for us and, and, and start from there can bring about better, more workable political coordinates that thinking we, we can change the totality because that's that's a lot. And that's my idea. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I think, um, so I agree with, so I, I, like, I, I like what you said about just, just as recent as uh, yesterday, I was teaching my students and then I, talk to them i like this fact that in philosophy you have the word philo which comes from love so there's something about love and i said to them they should when they study something they should kind of find some sort of love in themselves for the thing that they study because otherwise it's it's your analysis it gets yeah so you need to love the thing that you study in some way or another so i like that uh, that idea and i also like the idea of thinking of money as something sacred that's also an idea that i f that charles eisenstein that i love very like very much he also has then there was something in i mean i don't i don't know maybe i'm i don't know i only know as much about the position as what you just presented but there was something about making going from thinking us as superior to the objects and then making the objects superior to us and i maybe i'm miss interpreting what you said but whereas i would more like move towards that we're on the same level and also not i would also see if i could move towards connection like, like like we're connected to things rather than being separate from the objects we should be connected to them so in that sense we should kind of um, yeah uh, uh Yeah, that's just my sort of. When I listen to what you say, I think it makes sense. And and, but but I would go with connection rather than distinction. And and maybe he he also moves that way. Um, and then I, I'm also tempted to say a little bit about this totality, because I also one thing I experience, or is my idea about so 
like the, the old idea of revolution was this, that we would have like a systemic change. The whole system would change. And then maybe the, the, the revolution would just be propelled by a minority of people. And then they would provoke a systemic change and then everyone else would be affected. But I think the, 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 the problem with that idea of change is that then you just take one system and then you move to another system. And, and, and that's not where I think we need to go. We need to move out of the systems and into sovereignty. And also I think therefore the movement, on the one hand, it's a collective movement, but everyone has to do it themselves. It's like death. You have, you have to die yourself. It's like, yes, you can kill a lot of people at the same time, but they will all die individually. And I think it's the same thing that I experience here, that everyone needs to wake up. It, for every, each and every individual, it needs to be like an individual experience. And it also it has to be an experience where they feel that they need to do the work. So I, there's this slogan that I, I think they said in the 70s, the revolution will not be televised. And I predict that's also not going to happen with this thing. It's not like all of a sudden in the news, someone is going to say, oh, yeah, by the way, we figure out ha, the virus is not dangerous at all. It was a big hoax. Don't worry. Go back to, yeah, no problems. That's never going to happen. Because if it were to happen, people would say, ah, oh, 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 fine. Yeah, we can't trust the television. Ah, oh, yeah, fine. We'll just go on. So I think what needs to happen is that everyone kind of finds their own way in this, and then they wake up, and then they have this personal experience of sovereignty and that will give them the energy that they kind of need to move uh, forward so i'm not waiting for yeah uh, the television or someone else to kind of tell everyone now it's over or something each and every one of us need to do the work uh, some element of work it, it needs to be like a personal experience so therefore i also don't think this total solution is that's not going to happen or yeah, I, I don't think that's, uh, I'm not looking for that. Uh, and I'm not waiting for it either. Thank you. Uh, uh, actually, what the objects, the word they use is a dialogue with objects. Yes, and an okay. even level, a flat ontology is called. Uh, Fabio, go go. Yeah, ahead, I, I, this is very interesting. I, I Obviously, I don't claim that there's going to be a revolution, that the target is going to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something that would happen almost, I think, you know, one by one. Like, yeah. For example, the psychoanalytic method is one by one. It's not like everybody, it's one by one and little by little things will change, like the chain reactions, domino effects, whatever you want to call it, things will change. Second thing I wanted to say is uh, Zizek's notion of subject is very complicated, right? It's Hegelian and it's, it's, it's an interpretation of Hegel and it's not naive subjectivism, it's not idealism, um, the subject makes the world or the subject makes the world happen. It's not as stupid as that. It's not as naive as that, obviously. For, for Zizek, the subject is ultimately inserted in the, the object. It's always part of the world it looks at, right? It's always like object and subject are two sides of the same coin. If you take one side away, the other one goes as well. So that's, that's Zizek's ontology, I think. Subject and object are always part of the same whole, of the same uh, totality, whatever you want to call it, right, in Hegelian terms, of the, of the same reality, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes it interesting. And I, I think that gives it an advantage over um, object-oriented ontology, um, which is, I think, much more naive. Um, less i don't think is it's 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 i mean it reminds me a little bit of some critical theory positions back frankfurt school uh the preponderance of the object that you got with adorno for example the object is always something that you can never catch is is outside etc cetera, etc cetera. whereas i think it's more interesting to think subjectivity as always already inserted in the world we're looking at we're never looking at the world from outside but always inside the world we are looking at right this would be zizek's um position that's on um on on subjectivity and objectivity and then there was another point um i, for, I completely forgot um the last point you made Ole. I, I totally forgot uh i think this was the one with the individualized experience or the individual the totality yeah, sovereign. Sovereign. okay okay yeah, yeah. Sorry, i think yeah. you answered that one yeah sorry. yeah that's fine yeah, yeah. that's yeah. that's i think i wanted to say something else but you know you went mm. i need to have my dinner would you like to answer all that or? Uh, I think it's this is beyond my, um, 
was going to say beyond my pay grade, but that's not the right phrase here. But it's beyond. I, I think I, you know much more about this uh, object uh, uh, oriented uh, ontology. Uh, that yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not. Uh, one more thing I can say, maybe in relation to love, right? You mentioned mm. love, and I, I'm, I'm tempted to defend Zizek. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, slightly, yeah. I'm tempted, right? I'm not sure. Yeah, no, go ahead. But go ahead. Uh, like what Zizek would say, okay, um, you know, with capitalism, capitalism has. Also, as, oh, that's what I wanted to say earlier. I wanted to say something about fear. Sorry, I'll go back to that now. Yeah. Maybe the reason why people are not awakening or the majority are still not giving up fear, right? They're still hanging on to fear is because they know that if they relinquish their attachment to fear, they will lose the world they know hmm. because yes. that's the ultimate attachment to a world that is coming to an end, that it's imploding. I'm absolutely certain that this is, capitalism is in, literally on its last legs and yes. financialization is, is almost like a fetish to keep it going, right? Yeah. To give it a little bit extra fuel, yeah. to keep it going a little extra mile, a few miles. And that fear somehow gives people in a very conservative way rather, right? The feeling that they are hanging on to what they have, even if deep down, they know that it's not working any longer. Mm. You know, I think that, that that's something that maybe is worth reflecting on. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with it. I actually have a, I wrote a book or pamphlet, but I only published half of it because I don't know, for various reasons. And it was about conspiracy theories. And, um, and you always, so you have this question of why do people, you, you always ask, why do people believe in conspiracy theories? And then it's like, oh yeah, it's because they're crazy or they're in this echo. So what I asked was the other question, why do people not believe in conspiracy <laughs> theories? And I think the reason is exactly what you're saying. And I came across this concept in Wittgenstein where Wittgenstein had these, I, this concept of hinge proposition. So there's, there's like all kinds of propositions like, um, if you, for instance, like, uh, oh, um, if you say the university is part of the capitalist means of exploitation, then you'd be like, yeah, fine, I'll say that, that's fine. But if you say 9-11 uh, was a false flag, then you can't just say that. And then the rest of your world around that is intact. No, it has profound consequences for many, 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 many other things. And people know this, <laughs> they know this instinctively. So they have this sense, don't go there. Don't. And journalists in particular, I think that's the, one of their primary competences is that a keen instinct for this is that how much can we say without provoking like a real change in, in, in the ideas of, that's why they're so, uh, yeah. Uh, so, and I think, and, 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 um, and I also see, I've also seen that when people, like when people wake, wake up with one thing, like for me, it, uh, discovering the fact that banks create money was for me like a huge way. It's like, what, why did no one tell me this before? Just, what else did they not tell me? <laughs> so I, I, so I've just developed this skepticism. And whenever I hear someone say, oh, this guy's a conspiracy theorist, even though I don't know anything about him, anything about him, so I'll just say, okay, I'll go with that. I'll go with his opinion until, even if he says, well, the earth is flat. I'll say, yeah, I'll go with that until <laughs> the other, because I just, I hate the other position. I just hate it so much. So anyway, so yeah, that's one of my, um, so, but you're absolutely right that there is this, but I also think, I think there's a, you talked about, there's a, there's an economy here, or there's, there's a balance here, because at some point, the costs, the costs, both cognitive, but also for the rest of your system, of hanging on to your hinge propositions is going to be so high that you say, no, I'd rather go this way. Uh, and I think that's what's happening now. And that's, that's why we should love Klaus, Klaus Schwab because he's saying, okay, so this is not enough. It's not crazy enough for you to wake up. Okay, I will make it even more crazy. <laughs> so he's like, this, he's like this loving parent 
who ultimately wants his kids to grow up and move out of the home. So he has to make it a little bit more, more and more unpleasant. So ultimately you say, okay, then I go find my own place and then you move out. And then Klaus Hartmann will think, oh, finally, oh, I don't have to be this grumpy old guy. I can go meditate and do the yoga and all the things that I really want to do. And yeah. So um, yeah, anyway, blah, blah, blah. I, I think I'm just repeating myself here. Thank you, that was great. Um, any other question? I, I don't see any questions on the stream. Uh, will anyone- I'd, I'd, the... I'd, be curious to, I, I'd be curious to hear what's going on in Mexico. What, what's kind of on your mind? What's, what, what, what are the big questions in, 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 in your part of the world? Oh, well, question of that kind. <laughs> um, well, I mean, well, I said at the beginning that, that, I mean, at least on my political perspective, even though uh, we have the president I voted for and uh, politically and economically, right? Uh, what I think it's been a bit disappointing, I'm talking for myself here, but for many, is that he's basically following the same, the same state trends that were before, right? Maybe he's doing a bit of um, labor benefits, uh, social programs and stuff like that, which is fine. I mean, I, I'm all for helping people and all that, but nothing that, that drastically changes the nation uh, or, or the people in it, just um, um, uh, state projects that take a lot of land uh, that basically follow the same logics. One of my questions that, that I had, but, but I mean, you basically answered was, where do you see political uh, monetary ima imagination being worked on? Because here in Mexico, I don't see I don't see much of that, honestly. I don't know if some of my um, Mexican friends present would like to to give their opinion, uh, because yes, well, that's what's what I would like to say. What what I see in Mexico is is not like a radical change in, in politics with with AMLO being elected and and the work that's been done, but basically uh, a, a state that's trying to survive uh, the pressures that it's been trying to survive for decades. Uh, so so yes, but. Yes, that's that's what I'm seeing. Uh, I don't know if you have a, like a more specific question or anyone else here wants to to add something. And, and for example, one one thing that I wanted to mention about the um, uh, the, the climate change, uh, even though I, I I agree what you say that fear can be paralyzing. The thing is that uh, there's a lot of uh, immigrants uh, coming in because of that, like like, like the, the so-called climate refugees, and, and and the acknowledgement of that will have to be imperative for any future political uh, change. Something that that's, that that uh, mm. the capitalist scene author Francisco Serratos mentioned on the on on his talk the last week was that there will be radicalizations coming in. And, and, I, and they can go either way. They can be radicalization against immigrants, cruel politics that, that doesn't let them in into, into, into places, into, into safe havens, the, the, the ones that, that will be here. And another kind of radicalization will be that maybe what you said, the demand for communal love to be imperative in politics. That, that should be a kind of radicalization that we should all embrace. Uh, I mean, towards this, I mean, to this kinds and every kind of immigrant. And I think our country is still uh, like in the middle of that, um, maybe going more towards uh, xenophobia that we're used to in places like, I don't know, the United States, maybe. But what, one thing I, so we also have this, these debates about immigration here in, in this country. But just like in the, when I started looking into economics, and I really, and I, I all of a sudden I came across this question of where does money even come from? And it was kind of absent from the discussion. And I sometimes find that in the in, in these debates about immigration, you never really ask, or maybe I'm overgeneralizing, but sometimes I kind of, these wars, like a lot of the immigrants that we get, they come from the Middle East. So, and so they are, they are, they are fleeing from war. I totally get that. But the question that is not asked is, why do we have these wars in the first place? Where do they come from? And could we just stop them? And I think that's something that's gonna happen. Now, that's also a good thing, that, like, like the thing that's happening in Afghanistan, a lot of terrible thing, but a lot, also some good things. I think this is the last, I, I don't think the US, they can't, they're not gonna start a new war anywhere. I, I don't think the people are gonna put up with it anymore after this humiliation. So that's kind of stuff. So I think we can start addressing those questions. Like saying, okay, what? Maybe we can just stop having all these wars. Then people don't have to flee. Um, yeah. Actually, you, Lucas, you said you had this question about uh, El Salvador. You wanted to ask. 
Oh yes, uh, I thought we we can talk about that, but yes, about the the something I saw in the media and, and El Salvador with the with the with their new acceptance of Bitcoin that many media were celebratory of Bitcoin going down at the same time it was accepted by El Salvador and that there were technical yeah. issues with the wallets and stuff like that. Yeah. I was upset by that because it's a big change. It's a big move towards something that where we don't know where it's going to go. But I I, I was disappointed on the media were like celeb being celebratory of that as if that was the end of it as it uh, yeah. uh, like they were like saying see that's why you don't go you don't you don't strive away from the dollar you have to subject to the to that monetary system uh, I, I just don't buy it i just don't buy it and and no. bitcoin didn't even go that low really but, but what do you think about that move i mean besides being good or bad what, what do you think it tells about the current monetary imagination political imagination go ahead please yeah, so first of all, I had uh, the, a journalist called me yesterday asking exactly that question, saying, oh, now they implemented it and Bitcoin went down. And then I said to him, well, how is that even, what's the causality here? That's impossible. I mean, all, all, I mean, regardless of whether it works or not, you would expect that at least it would be the same level or it would go up. All economic rationality would, why would anyone say, oh, now they've implemented it in El Salvador. Before they didn't, now they did. I'm going to sell my Bitcoins. Why would you, any rational, no rational investors would do that. So either it's, it's a completely different mechanism. Uh, it's a coincidence or something like that. Or there are some people who hold enough Bitcoin to be able to affect prices, who for some reason have an interest in this not being a success or not spreading to other countries, something like that. That was the only explanation I could come up with. I will say, I, I think it's great. I think it's great. And I think it's, and I think it, it's actually tied to, this something I also write about in the book, this, how the, the dollar has this special privilege of being sort of the reserve currency of the whole world. And, that's been sustained by a number of factors, but one of them is certainly military. And I think what we're seeing right now is a, an American leadership that's weaker than ever, ever before. Um, and, and that means that a lot of countries who used to be like, oh no, we have to do what America says. They also, they're getting rid of their fear and say, no, we'll just do what we want. So, they, so I think we'll also see, also see a lot of countries, for instance, El Salvador, um, and as well as other countries kind of also rediscovering their own sovereignty and say, oh, maybe we don't have to be afraid of uh, the United States anymore. We'll just go with uh, whatever we want. So, um, and both politically, but also economically. So I, yeah, I could certainly see that happening. Yes, and, and that will be a, a change that uh, even though it could, uh, like in the uh, short term, could have damaging effects, uncertainty, of course, on the middle and long term, we, we really don't know what's, what where it's going to lead, right? So we have to, no. I, I do think we have to keep an open mind in that sense that we don't really love the current system. So why are we so attached to it? What Fabio exactly. said, what you said. So yes, yes. Uh, thank you for your answer. Um, yeah. If someone else has another question or comment, yeah. uh, this will be the time because otherwise it's a good time to, to end the session. Uh, okay, yes, I don't see any hands raising. Uh, Ole, thank you very much for being with us. It was a very exciting discussion. It was very interesting that it veered towards love and, and sovereignty and responsibility, but but I think good talks um, are not like strict, right? <laughs> and they mm -hmm. they are rhizomatic maybe. <laughs> so I, I thank you very much for being here. Uh, anything else you want to say before um, saying goodbye? I will say that this book, The Meaning of Being a Man, is will be coming out in Spanish soon. And uh, my friend Jesus is, uh, yeah, he's translating it. Uh, he's already translating, so he's just, uh, yeah, correcting the dots or something like that. So it's gonna come out. Um, and in the spirit of, uh, of the new world, it's gonna be under uh, what's a common, come on, creative, creative, Commons creative Commons license. Creative Commons license. So uh, the digital version you can get for free. So uh, look out for that. Just like his book, Hacer Dinero, Making Money is for free. Uh, and I put the link there. Uh, this, one, this one will also be free in Spanish, right, Jesus? 
Uh, yep. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll be, uh, I mean, maybe this will not be the, the perfect place to discuss it, but I'm sure we'll find one. Uh, it will be a very exciting book. I'd be happy. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Well, again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for all the participants. Uh, please follow our social media for future talks and we'll have a, have a great uh, blessed day.